Wow. We are back in the treasures of you, dog. Great book by Daniel Lowe. And the Mysteries of the West. Picking it up on page 114. Here's what one Spaniard, Reverend Father Friar Marco de Nisa, in 1495 was told when he encountered a group of friendly Indians around northern Arizona, likely near where the Spaniard thought was the city of Cibola. Remember this? Cibola on the map, right? Cibola, C-E-V-O-L-A. Some spell C-E-U-O-L-A. Is also Shibala. Shiba. Shimbala, Shabala, Shabala, Shimbala, Sibola, Sibola, Sibola. <laughs> All right, so we're getting warmer, my nagas. You know, we're, we're <laughs> seeing the picture of these seven cities of gold, how they relate to Jerusalem, connected to the tree of life and the root systems that connect it all. That the seven is the Shabbat and the Shabbat is the Sheba, is the Sibola, Sibola, seven cities. What do the seven cities have to do with the Shabbat? What do they have to do with Queen Sheba, Khalifa? Who some call Lilith. What do they have to do with the land of Prestige? Cibola. So this Spaniard, Reverend Father Marco de Nice, you know, this is that joker that uh, Estebanico was traveling with. In, in 1495, he was told when he encountered a group of Indians around northern Arizona, likely near where the Spaniard thought was the cities of gold, right? The city of Cibola. Shown on the Granada map. Granada is pomegranate, pomegranate, my night. That's what Jake, that's what uh, Joshua and Caleb had to bring back to prove their connection with this promised land, man. So, this Granata, Pomegranata, Nova map in the land of Cibola, which is Kalelus, which means promised land. Pomegranate, promised land. Pomegranate is also Remon in Hebrew. R I M O N is Pomegranate in Hebrew. Is the Roman. The Remani is the. Pomegranate promised land naga. It is your original indigenous titles, which is likely located at the Hopi village of Old Oribe. Oribe. Hmm. Now it says, These Indians I advertise by my interpreter according to my instructions. In the knowledge of our Lord God in heaven and of the emperor in these countries and in all places else by all ways and means possible. I sought information where any countries were of more cities and possible or in people of civility and understanding than those which I have found and I could hear no new new of any such or news of any such, albeit they told me 
that four or five days journey within the country at the foot of the mountains, there is a large and mighty plain where they told me that there were great towns and people clad in cotton. And when I showed them certain metals, which I carry with me, I learned what rich metals were in the land. They took the mineral of gold and told me that thereof were vessels among the people of that plain and that they carried certain round green stones hanging on their nostrils. And that their cares and that they have certain thin plates of gold wherewith they scrape off their sweat and that the walls of their temples are covered therewith and that they use it in all their household vassals. Many would take this place with the mighty plain as the Salt Lake Valley. Why was the Friar Marco looking for people of civility and understanding in such a brutish and uncivilized place? What reason would he have to ask, or did he have prior knowledge? Did he know of a former colony from the old world? Reading his day by day account of this expedition, he meets with nothing but hostile Indians from the time he left the southern city near the mouth of the California Gulf. So hostile Indians are those that are fierce and violent, towards the hijack because uh, we want to be hijack free. No hijacks allowed. You don't get to show up and start stealing and killing. Those are called hostile Indians. What's the definition of a dragon in 1828? Definition number three is a fierce or violent person, man or woman. This man or woman is a dragon. 1828 dictionary. So these hostile Indians are Dragon. Khan. And you know, he encountered them all the way up to the mouth of California. <laughs> so we got the, you know what I'm saying, the, the Khalifa tribe, man, already popping off. Until he encountered these people somewhere in northern Arizona, why would he think even of looking for civilized people? I mean, what did he know, right? Again, it is my belief that this Lake Capola, which has the cities around it, did in fact exist in the basin area as far west as Duchess or Duchesne, Duchesne, encompassing the Roosevelt area and as the as far north as White Rocks and Vernal, east as far as Dinosaur, Colorado. <laughs> did you know there was a Dinosaur, Colorado? And since they didn't use the word dinosaur until 1841, my knock, the definition, I mean, the, the word dinosaur is invented, literally invented in 1841. So this dinosaur Colorado would be dragon Colorado, just like there's a dragon Utah where they mine the Gilsonite. She loves you to quit. So this Lake Kapala had cities around it, man. We're talking Utah, man. Cities. As far as Dinosaur, Colorado and South encompassing the majority of South Ore and its drainage being the Great River. Now the reasoning behind the theory goes much deeper than I'm willing to put in this book. Okay, Daniel Lowe, you hiding something? You gonna hide it from us, Daniel Lowe? Come on, man. It's me, man. It's Drop Nation, man. But let's see what kind of clues he leaves, man, to what he's hiding. 
He says, now the reasoning behind the theory goes much deeper than what I am willing to put in this book. But the reason for pointing this out all has to do with the legendary seven cities of Cibola, which are the cities of gold. And why is he pointing out that Lake Kapala in Utah had cities around it? I mean, you don't want to go much deeper than that, right? <laughs> Seven cities of Cibola existing around a lake called Copala. The very reasons I believe so many of the past have continued to come to this place in search of certain things. It would almost seem as though after the days of King Solomon, rumors of his rich mines in the land of Ophir. And these things being documented, which we have yet to see the half of it, would have circulated among the royal families of Europe. Who are the royals? Who are the Russes? Yeah, that's still uh, black people, so-called, right? Black royal families in Europe, in Asia, in Monaga. Europe is Asia. And they knew that that King Solomon was popping off over here. They know that Ophir is over here. And they know that the land of Preston John is over here. Lego. Royal families of Europe being the descendants of King David and Solomon. And that's exactly what it was, you know, being spoken of in the forbidden histories of America by the same author Daniel Lowe, you know what I mean, is that these were Davidic kings and Davidic princes that came over here around the 700s, you know, going to war against, you know what I'm saying, the, the family of David that's already here, man. It was a Judah on Judah war, you could say, you could say, you know, Israel on Israel war, I mean, at the least, you know, it could be a northern southern tribe situation. But after the days of Solomon, the, the kingdom is divided, right? So, con con. Either way, you know, you know what they're looking for now. You know, they're looking for these seven cities of gold. The whole Coronado expedition that was popping that off. Estebanico was looking for that too, right? That's where we got that cities of gold. Esteban and them, he's trying to... He, He's literally, you know what I'm saying, leading the hijack to you, to your drop. So the royal families of Europe, let's back it up. It would almost seem as though after the days of King Solomon, rumors of his rich mines in the land of Ophir, and these things being documented, which we have yet to see the half of it, would have circulated among the royal families of Europe, being the descendants, the descendants of King David and Solomon, the descendants of Preston John. If there is any validity to this, it would not surprise me if there were others who came in search of King Solomon's mines several hundred years later and discovered in the area a thriving civilization with cities who had used thin sheets of gold to cover their temples, of which the Spaniards were told existed by the natives they encountered. It is likely that not a one of the natives Friar Marco encountered had ever been to this place, they described, only handing down to the Spanish what they have been told for hundreds of years. It is more likely the Spaniard had knowledge of these golden cities long before they ever left Spain. I have in the past pondered this possibility of the existence of this lake existing at a much later time frame than I had supposed 
and that which science has guessed. And, you know, it's interesting, you know, saying, you know, love to the tribe, man. Uh, when we first got our land out in Utah and, you know, what I'm saying, um, I mean, we, we got mountains connected to our land that, you know, that are very high up, man. So, you know, one time we were just surveying and, you know, going up these mountains and, you know, checking out just different markers around the land. And we were way, way up, man, and got to this spot, man, that was literally like a patch of beach, beach sand, man. It was just straight up fine beach sand way up in the mountains, my nag. I'm talking. Way up, like Machu Picchu type, like way up, my night. And uh, it was beach sand, man. And, you know, you you could tell, you know, a few people had crossed through there. You, you saw, like, stones that were stacked and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, one person that was with us, you know, that was a uh, part of the whole survey situation, you know, he said, yeah, man, all this area used to be underwater at some point in time. And, you, I mean, we saw little little uh, shells and everything, man. It was, it was a beach in the mountain. It was, didn't make any sense. But now it's making all the sense when you factor in Lake Kapala and, you know, just how things used to look with the waters not being quite receded all the way like they are right now. Now, why wouldn't the waters be receded yet, yeah, man? Does, does that have any connection with the great flood situation? You know what I mean? Where the water's just not re fully receded yet. You know what I mean? It, it looked like North America was pretty much two continents with this water in between. You know, you know right up the gut in the middle. Is that water that hadn't quite receded to the waters below yet, beneath yet. Waters above, waters below, right? So, and in sizing migration, you have a famine because all the waters, you know, that used to be there pretty much, you know, disappear quickly. How is that connected with these great cataclysms, man? Like this cataclysm of 880 that we've been digging about, digging on, go get that, you know, the great flood of 880. Obviously, very close to that 900 and Anasazi situation. And whatever happened with the flood, you know, when the waters receded, they fully receded. Like, you know, it left them with, you know, very little to go off. So they had to migrate, you know, throughout the four corners, you know, what I mean, into Mexico. You know, you got the Tinoch Titlan situation popping off, 1300s, man. So Columbus pops up, what, 1400s, about 100 years later? All this is just happening. It's all just happening, man. In more ways than one, man. But yeah, when you factor in how, how high the waters, you know, could have been recently, man. And that the entire face of the earth has been changed. Then you have to empty your cup. You got to approach this information with a dragonfly perspective, even if it seems a little, you know, difficult to digest at first. Be patient with yourself, man. You're going to get it. We going to get it. We got it, my knock. Let go. Let's pick it up from right here, you know, page 115. Wow. If there's any validity to this, it would not surprise me if there were others who came in search for King Solomon's gold, California gold rush, California gold rush. What's it got to do with Montezuma's treasure, man? Mansa Musa, man. King Solomon's mine several hundred years later and discovered in the area, a thriving civilization with cities who had used them or had used thin sheets of gold to cover their temples, of which the Spaniards were told existed by the natives they encountered. It is likely that not a one of the natives Friar Marco encountered had ever been to this place they described. 
only handing down to the Spanish what they had been told for hundreds of years. It is more likely the Spaniards had knowledge of the golden cities before they left Spain. I have in the past pondered this possibility of the existence of this lake existing at a much later time frame than I had supposed and that which science had guessed. It is no secret. There is an ancient lake in this region. However, science claims this lake to be 34 to 55 million years ago. And I'm sorry. I just don't believe it for for a reason already given and will be given in some which I cannot include in this book. It is my belief that the information of the of the discoveries of the cities of gold because of the gold used to cover their temples made its way back to Europe to the royal families long before the Spaniards and French. And this was the beginning of the legends of the seven cities. So he doesn't he clearly has his doubts that these cities are real, right? <laughs> that they just went on a hunch <laughs> and said, oh, those are gold-plated cities, not really gold. You know, oh, that's not really this. These are just myths, you know. Um, <laughs> because these are not necessarily things that they can roll up on in their energy, you know what I'm saying? You know, certain things you got to tap into. I don't think what they're looking for can be tapped in by them. You know what I'm saying? They'll find just regular stuff. You know, they, they won't find the drop because they don't have the access to the drop. I mean, you're talking about a whole other frequency, man. You're talking about realms existing on top of realms. If you have the capability to build cities of gold, then surely you've connected, you know what I'm saying, much, much deeper knowledge, my not. They have the ability, man, to, you know, hit them vortexes, man, be in this realm, be in that realm. You know what I'm saying? Energy field. You know what I mean? Like, you don't even understand, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But instead of saying, I don't understand, the hijack says, eh, it's not even true. I mean, I hear that they had, you know, gold-plated cities, you know, <laughs> thin layers of gold. And that became a rumor of the seven cities. Because they didn't find nothing, it must be a rumor. That's Hijack City, man. That's Hijack City. Lego. It is my belief that the information and the discoveries of the cities of gold, because of the gold used to cover the temple, made its way back to Europe to the royal families long before the Spains and French. And this was likely the beginning of the legends of the seven cities. Okay. Dodge your own hijack. Many expeditions have been coming to this place ever since and the rumors of much earlier expeditions go back even before the times of the rumored Prince Madoc of the Welsh in the 1100s or those of the Knights nice Templar. Now to give this strange 34 million year old lake that some have managed to end up on seven, somehow managed to end up on 17th century maps. So how can this 34 million year old lake end up on a 17th century map, 1600s map, man. Managa, how do you know what's going on in the 1600s? It might as well be 34 million years ago, the way they've changed times and laws. They push it back to 34 million years. It, it literally leaves your, your consciousness. You can't even conceive that. They tell you the sun's 96 million miles away. You can't even conceive that. You know, you just got to just accept it, man. <laughs> It's unbelievable, right? That's how they play the numbers game. They just push stuff so far back to the BCs. And, you know, BCs is like irrelevant because it's just so far back to us. But what if there ain't no C? What if there ain't no C? <laughs> then there ain't no BC. Con, con, okay. You got to dodge on IJ. How did this 34, year, 34 million year old leg end up in 17th century maps? Let's look at this map created by H. Moll, M-O-L-L, a geographer in 1720. According to the legend of the map, 
quote, a great deal of the map is taken from the original droughts of Nathaniel Blackmore and Richard Beresford. I would also suspect coming from an earlier source such as Baron de La Hattin. The problem is La Hattin never made it to the lake. So where did Blackmore or Beresford get their curiously accurate drawing of a 34 million year old Lake Kapala? There was a time I thought Lahontan was full of hot air in his account of the Long River. It would seem there was some truth in his words. How much was lost in the interpretation Lahontan got from the natives or misunderstood is, is anyone's guess. In reading his account of the Long River, I have to ask, how did the natives understand the distance of a league? Keep in mind they didn't understand a word of English. How is it the map makers of these maps manage to document with a great deal of accuracy? Things that make you go, hmm. And this Lake Kapala kind of reminds me of like the Cappadocia situation. The Kappa is the Kaaba, or is the Kaaba. The Kaaba is the Copper. The Copper is the Kapala. What does Kapala have to do with Copper? What does copper have to do with Kieber? And what does Kieber have to do with Heber and Eber? Yeah, copper is Eber. Is the Eber rule the copper color kind? Is the Kabbalah? Kabbalah? What, is the, what does Lake Kabbalah have to do with the Kabbalah, man? <laughs> oh, man. Oh, man. It's all happening. It's all happening. And for the dismount, man, we'll... You know, connect on some familiar territory with these artifacts, man, in Arizona on page 119. We're again in the book Treasures of Utah by Daniel Lowe. You know, same author as Nephite North, you know, giving us some great introduction, man, before we start digging even deeper. You know, we also read the book Calais Luz by uh, Cyclone Covey, great source, as well as uh, uh, Donald Yates' book. Uh, the uh, the Rodin or, or the Merchants of Rhoda, you know, again, going on these Kalelus artifacts. So we have a few different sources on this Kalelus looking for a lot more. Page 119. Other than the following story being quite interesting. It has a point, in fact, several, so please bear with me. In 1924, there was a discovery of certain artifacts near Tucson, Arizona. 32 objects, my night, of which were crosses resembling those of medieval times. Now, some of these crosses are swords, and that's where they throw some word games out, you know, but let's go. Like every discovery that cannot be explained, the hoax factor crept in to the fine, although many knew it was legitimate. Legit, my night. The story, after 90 years, finally made it to a forensic geologist by the name of Scott Walter. Mr. Walter has recently conclusively proven the artifacts as authentic, confirming what many already knew even before Scott Walter's investigation, anyone who has investigated the details of this find could not honestly conclude the artifacts were a hoax, unless, of course, they have an agenda to do so. The most interesting thing about these artifacts are not only where they were found, but the story they told as there are writings there. There was writings on several of them. In Latin, some also say there was Hebrew and Greek found on them. So, we'll, you know, what's all these languages doing in America, you know, uh, in the 8th century, you know what I'm saying? You know, they, they say it's, these are popping up in the 700s, man. 700, 700 AD, something like that. 770, man. I mean, let's go. 
So you got the Hebrew on these artifacts. I mean, we got to keep talking about them, man, because they don't want to talk about it no more. But in the early 1920s, man, this was all over in the, in the New York newspapers and everything. And the Jewish community was claiming these things originally. They said, wow, we found evidence of Jewish, uh, you know, Jew uh, a Jewish colony or whatever the case is. Jewish life in America. All the way back to the 8th century, they, they, they had all this stuff, but then they... Stop talking about it, because then they had to, you know, heavy ways to crown, my nugget. Heavy ways to crown. When you claim to be the royals, man, you got to really claim it all the way. You got to be able to say, yeah, we was already here before all these indigenous so-called people. Yeah, the, the Jewish people were here wielding our swords and fighting Sylvanus to Texas and, and Theodorus. They got to claim these people. And they cannot do it since most of them even say today that they're converts. Ashkenazis have nothing to do with this. This ain't the Sephardim. This ain't the Ashkenazim. These are. Th this is the Davidic line, my naga. <laughs> this is King David's bonds and bots, my naga. This is Solomon's bots and bonds, my naga. This is the actual line of Yashara, man. The original Nagas. Heavy ways to crown, man. They can't claim this, man. These people in synagogues today ain't walking around with, you know, dragon swords, man. Yeah, these swords got dragons on them, man. Dragon swords out of Arizona. They ain't, they ain't, they ain't rocking like that. You can't visualize them with expert swordsmanship, my Naga. Like, are you serious, man? They ain't got the coordination for this. The strength for this. They gotta use trickery, man, and, and necromancy, man. They, they, they ain't they ain't walking like you. They ain't surfing your wave, man. So if they can't claim it, no one can but you. If the convert can't claim it, Monaga, then the actual evil rule. You know what I mean? He has to uh, walk in his shoes again. Walk in her shoes again. Let's go for the dismount. He got this Hebrew writing on him. Several of the artifacts had specific dates placed on these, on these items having been likely abandoned by those who made them what would seem to be in the late 9th century, man. 800s. Come on, man. They can't claim this, man. They, the Jewish people can't say they was here before Columbus rocking an entire kingdom my knock <laughs> that sounds ridiculous you know you know how many more lies they gotta hold down just for that man and you know here's just uh like it's the first time man here's here's a few of the inscriptions on what's being found in arizona man for the dismount on these crosses and swords lego All right, so on the cross arm at the left is a profile of a head with the words Britain, Britain, Albion, Jacob. In the center is another head profile with the words Roman. Remember, Rimon is pomegranate, pomegranata, granata, promised land. And then Actim and Theodore. All right, we got to decipher this. On the right is another head profile with the words Gaul, Sinai, or Sini, Israel. Okay. On a vertical beam of the leg cross is the inscription Councils of, Councils of Great Cities together with 700 soldiers. A.D. 800 Managi talking America. Artifacts in Arizona. Let's go. January 1st. We are born over the sea to Kalelus, an unknown land where Totexas Sylvanus ruled far and wide over people. Now, this Sylvanus Totexas or Totexas is the founder of the Toltecs, man, which is Solomon the Builder. 
in Forbidden Histories of America, he goes into that. So this told Texas is Solomon, the builder, son of Sylvanus O'Gon, which is why we got to really break down this tree language, right? This O'Gon, the Celtic script is connecting us, you know, maybe to some of the Voynich breakdown, Voynich manuscript. The Ogons connected to Ogiers, which are the Olmec, which are the Shi, which are the Tangu. <laughs> Let's go. Theodore transferred his troops to the foot of the city, Rhoda, and more than 700 were captured. No gold is taken away. Theodore, a man of great courage, rules for 14 years. Jacob rules for six. With the help of God, nothing has to be feared in the name of Israel. This is on the swords and the artifacts. This is on the lead cross, they say. Managa. In Arizona, which is Utah. Is it play play? The second cross has the following inscription. Jacob renews the city with God's help. Jacob rules with mighty hand in the manner of his ancestors. Saying to the Lord, may his fame live forever. This is how they're translating it, my night. So what does it really say, right? Does it say, Lord, this is how they're translating it, my night. That Jacob renews the city. With Hawaz help, Jacob rules with mighty hand in the manner of his ancestors. Sing to Hawa, may his fame live forever. This is on the artifacts in Arizona. The third cross yielded this inscription from the egg, the beginning. A.D. 700 to A.D. 900. Nothing but the cross, the towel, right? The war is raging. Israel died. Pray for the soul of Israel. This is right before this Anasazi migration. This, this kickoff that they are now, you know what I'm saying, leaving this famine situation. So may the earth lie light on thee. He adds glory to the ancestral glory. Israel, defender of the faith. Israel reigns 67 years. Now going back to one of those other uh, cross inscriptions where it says councils of great cities together with 700 soldiers, A.D. 800, January 1st, we are born over the sea to Kalelus. Again, over the sea doesn't mean the Atlantic Ocean. Not back then when half of North America, you know, is separated by water from the other half of North America. What they're translating as unknown land, is that what they're saying? Uh, could it be that in 700 or around that time, one piece was still unknown to the others based on some catastrophe that happened around that time? Like, what's popping? We... We have to factor in what they mean by unknown. And is that the correct translation? But we were born over the sea. Being born over the sea, my God, I mean, again, factor in the, factor in the uh, rise in water, my God, factor in the water level and you have different seas, man. Let's go. The next inscription, Israel the second rules for six. Israel the third was 26 years old when he began to rule. Internecine war to conquer or die. He flourishes in ancestral honor day by day. The next inscription, AD 880, Israel the third for liberating the told Texas was banished. He was first to break the custom. The earth shook, fear overwhelmed the hearts of men in the third year after he had fled. The earth shook, my naga. 
Mmm. And look how that date matches up with that great flood of 880. We was just dropping on. Just, you know, go back, con drop, flood of 880. You know, get that drop because, yeah, man. Something happened around 880. Something happened that, that popped off the Anasazi to, you know what I'm saying, get on the good foot, man. Switch locations up. The earth shook. What's that got to do with Atlantis falling? Come on, man. Fear overwhelmed the hearts of men in the third year after they had fled. They betook themselves into the city and kept themselves within their walls. A dead man thou shalt na neither bury, bury nor burn in the city. Before the city, a plain was exist extending. Hills rung the city. So this is what they meant by... Uh, Israel the third was was banished for liberating to Texas. Cause to Texas, you know, have broken the custom of not burying inside the city. You know what I'm saying? So he chose to, you know, bury someone inside the city and they said, Oh, that's against the custom, All right? So then he was liberated by Israel the third. <clears throat> and Israel the third ended up being banished for liberating Sylvanus Totex. Okay, okay, let's go. It is a hundred years since Jacob was king. Jacob stationed himself in the front line. He anticipated everything. He fought much himself, often smote the enemy. Israel turned his attention to the appointment of priest. We have life, a people wild, widely ruling. We have life of people widely ruling. And one more says, uh, AD 895, an unknown land, would that I might accomplish my task to serve the king. It is uncertain how long life will continue. There are many things which can be said while the war rages. 3,000 were killed. The leader with his principal men are captured. Nothing but peace was sought. God ordains all things. In an article I found speaking of this fine titled The Jewish Catholic State in America, it tells some very interesting things that in my understanding brings many things into perspective concerning the many rumors of early voyages to this land. In the article, it tells of Kaleluz, which is the land of America, and Septimania, which is, the, which is lower France, which existed in about 700 AD. So Kaleluz is promised land, is the land of America. Managa, who can claim this history? Who on earth can claim your history? The proxy Indians in America don't know what you're talking about. They don't even know who built the mound. So when you talk Sylvanus Mount, you know, Totexas, Toltec, Mound Builders, Solomon, the Builder, man, they can't connect with that. You ain't from Africa, man. This is your history, man. You are the Knights. Let's go. The Kaleidos records speak of a Theodorus as the leader of many peoples who leave the Roman lands for Kaleidos in 775 AD. Theodorus is none other than the Jewish king of Septimania, a Roman Jewish state in southern France. He is the son of the first Jewish king of Septimania, Jewish, Jewish, Jewish. Really, man? In the 700s in America, man? Ain't you just now converting with King Bulan and them in the 8th century over there, man? Ain't you just converting, man? What do you mean you got a kingdom under Sylvanus Toltec? See, now the Jew has to now say, yeah, we popped off the Toltecs. This is a Jewish Roman colony, so, you know. We have Jewish people, Jewish and Jews and Jewishes. No, you have Hebrews. 
Hebrews are the Totec. Hebrews are the Aztec. Joshua is leading Aztecs, Monaghan. Ute Aztecan. So let's read this correctly. The Kalelu's record speaks of a Theodorus as the leader of many peoples who leave the Remani lands for Kalelu's. So they have a Granata, right? They have a Ramon. You know, they have a, you know, land of promise where they're at, but they're leaving it for this Kalelu's land in 775. Now, who's, ne who's Nehemiah Theodorus? Who is this Maki? Who is now marching up in America, right? Does he belong here? Is he connected here? Is he from the same tribe, but has been rocking in Asia over there? Let's go. Theodorus is none other than a Hebrew of Septimani, we're talking sept, right? Seven cities. So he's already connected with these seven cities. A Romani Hebrew state in France. Who's the Franks? Let's go. He is the son of the first Hebrew king of the seven cities, Septimania. And also called Theodoric. Theodoric, Thierry, and Ameri. And we said before, has this factored into the equation of how America, you know, why do we call America America? He's also called Amor Ben Amor. You hear all these other theories about America's name. But this is <laughs> a Davidic. A, a prince of David, my naga, in the 700s, also known as Amarik. All you gotta do is put an A at the end. And his daddy's name, Amarik. Amaru, right? Amari. Makir. Todrus. Theodorus. Dietrich. Theoderic. Ameri, the first, Chetif, Nehemiah, Neman. Amor ben Amor is also known as Theodore, king of Saxony. Isaacsony, Isaacsony, Isaacs, Isaac's sons, Saxons, Isaac Saxony, king of Saxony. And as a name is Duke of Bavaria, he and his brothers were great warrior. David, Davidic princes of the time of Charlemagne. And we know Charlemagne also called himself David. Charlemagne just means great king. On the death of his father, Machir Theodoric, in about 765 AD, Nehemiah Theodoric becomes the Western Exilarch. That's the leader during this leader of the Hebrews during captivity. So he's leading the Hebrews during a captivity and leader of all the Hebrews of the revived Western Remani Empire of Charlemagne. So he's the man-man, right? And he's coming up on another man-man with Solomon the Builder in there, man. They seem to be having a, a family sit down. He's a warrior Davidic prince. Solomon's the son of David. It's very similar with the uh, ne Nebuchadnezzar situation. You know, Nebuchadnezzar possibly being a son of Solomon. And Sheba, you know, he's rolling back in, you know, as a royal. But, you know, with a particular purpose. What's Nehemiah's purpose in the script to rebuild the city, to rebuild the wall? This Nehemiah also wants to rebuild a wall, right? Wants to put a wall of protection up. In 775 AD, Nehemiah Theodoric reconquered. So he had it before, connected with his family of Davids. 
reconquered the American empire of Kaleilus. Kaleilus means promised land. And no one can really, you know, give us the real origin of that word Kaleilus, you know. So it's up for grabs in terms of the origin. You know, it doesn't fit into any of their language systems, my noggin. But it's written on the artifacts in Arizona, though. Kalelus was ruled by Sylvanus Totaxis Solomon the Builder, the hereditary ruler of this former Hebrew-ruled colony, Hebrew-ruled Roman or Rimon pomegranate colony. Kalelus was founded in the first century B.C. by the Babylonian exilarch known as Sylvanus Ogon. Or Sylvanus Brabo, who are the Brabo, who are the barber. And why does barber mean swan in Hebrew? And who is the swan knights? Solomon II, Babylonian exilarch, Nazi of Mara, ruler of Sumer. Who's the ruler of Sumer? A great Roman. Jewish ruler <laughs> or a Rimon pomegranate Hebrew ruler, my not pomegranate soldier and ancestor of the Swan Knights. Who's the Bravos? Who's the Barbers? Who's the Bravos? Who's the Barber Hakazin? He also had a fleet of trading vessels known as the Ships of Solomon. Okay, okay, so he got a fleet of ships vessels just like solomon in the bible right this solomon got a fleet of ships that solomon got a fleet of ships this solomon's right here in america where his daddy david pressed the priest king is also right here in america and you my negro friends are questioning your origin you have no idea where you come from right here in America. Promised land, Kalelu. Last part right here we'll get. The ships are shaped like swans with its tails or its sails like the wings of a beautiful gliding white swan. So King Solomon's vessels were shaped like swans because <laughs> he's a barber bravo a swan knight my not the ships are shaped like swans with its sails like the wings of a beautiful gliding white swan and after the defeat of sylvanus totexes totex the members of the royal family these royal Negroes were sent back to Asia, Europe, where they were under protection of Nehemiah Theodorus and his family. They protected them there. They didn't torture them and put them to death, right? So this is a family on family, David on David, Judah on Judah, Israel on Israel war. They were under the protect, protection of Nehemiah, Theodorus, Makir, Amari. And the legends of Ogier the Dane, son of Godfrey, Kadrod, and Doom de Mayence actually refer to Tuatha de Danan or Dunan, who were also known as Mananan or Maine of America. Body bag for the illusion. So you can't even mention Danan or Dan without mentioning man or man and man or man. Not the man in the East Coast today, but the man and man that was right there over the four corners. I'm talking Colorado, I'm talking New Mexico, Arizona, Utah. Now check it. These Tawatha de Danans, these Dunans, these Mananans, 
or Maine of America is where the giant ogre heads. Yeah, ogre like Shrek, right? Yeah, this is how they make fun of us, right? So where the giant ogre heads of the Almec are found. So now we see clearly when we stare at these beautiful Almec, you know what I'm saying, landmarks, my noggin. These faces that look just like, you know, Uncle Nuck Nuck in them, you know. Every time I see an ogre head, I think about my Uncle Paul, man. <laughs> my mom's brother, man. One thigh wow. Every single part of their features I'm seeing is in my Uncle Paul, man. Rest in power. Where the giant ogre heads of the Almec are found. So the ogres in Shrek and in the cities of gold, they got the little ogre looking Almecs. <laughs> but these Almecs <laughs> are your family, my family, are, you know, the Jaredites, right? Are the Israelites, my knight? Are the Khans. They made us look like ogres, right? The Irish legend of Regamon also allude to this family, man. Lawa. He said, I personally would not read into the implication of the Almec possibly being these people from Septimania. <laughs> he puts a disclaimer and says, uh, I, I wouldn't look into these black faces being the people, you know, because I want them to be whites. Come on, man. You don't got to disclaimer us. You just said the ogre heads were the, of the army. The ogre heads of the army. Of the army. Of the army. Now you want to discount the army? You brought the army in. Then he took it out. In the Forbidden, history, in the forbidden Histories of America, this same section is in there. And the Almecs are not even mentioned. Here he mentions it, but then he gives a disclaimer and says, I personally would not read too much into the implication of the Almec <laughs> possibly being these people from Septimania, seven cities, as there is too much evidence to the contrary to even consider. Is he going to give us any evidence? No, he's just going to keep going. So the same game he plays the same game he mentions being played with the Kaleidos artifacts being just thrown around as a hoax because, you know, because it, it fits their agenda. He does the same thing with the Almec right here. He throws it out because it doesn't fit his agenda. Even though it's mentioned in the quote, right, not by him, but in the quote from the article he said he found titled A Jewish Catholic State in America. Huh? So they're claiming a Jewish Catholic state in America. But they're not telling you that Catholic is Cathay. Cathay is on the map in North America or Asia. Cathay is Katai. Katai of the Kara Katai of Prester John. Kara Katai is the Cathay, is the Catholic, is the Catholic. Katai. Katai is Cathay, is Catholic, my not is the land of Preston John. So they can't just say I found the land of Preston John. They got to say a Jewish Catholic Catholic state in America. That makes no damn sense, man. Any other evidence of Jewish Catholics around here, man? Stop it, man. Now you're just being silly. Now y'all just are being silly, man. And so is uh this author sometimes, man, I'm trying to discount the all make all of a sudden after you just quoted from that same article that the ogre of the all make are found right here connected with the ogam so venus ogam and the ogir and the o ogam script my naga connected to the celts like he just said about the regamon drop the irish legend of regamon also allude to this family so you're talking celts which means you're talking Ogam script, that tree language, which means you're talking Sylvanus Ogam, the father of Sylvanus Totexas, man. Solomon the Builder. Swan Knights, my knight. Swan Knights. 
Swanites are the Ame. Swanites are the Ame. Last part is this for the disc, man. Let's go, man. Israel the third, right? So we got all these Israel the first, the second, the third written on these artifacts in Arizona. Israel the third went south to the Toltec lands of Mexico and his grandson, Makir Amarik. Or Merig in the Welsh genealogies or Mixcoto of the Toltec. So this Makir Theodorus that protected the family after, you know, he defeated uh, the Toltecs in them, you know. He is the Mixcoto of the Toltecs. He's in the codexes, man. So all we got to do is dig on the codexes under Mace Kohoto to see the other part of the story that relate to Makir Amarik. And if he's in the codexes and his name is Amarik, A-M-E-R-I-C, it's just missing an A, my nagi. Is this the name of America? Was it named after Mix Kohoto of the Toltecs? I'll wait. Now, he was the grandfather of Topilzin, T-O-P-I-L-Z-I-N, who is also Israel, the seventh priest of Kitzikoltu, or Joshua, who left Cholula for Rhoda in about 1000 A.D. He rejoined the remnant of the Rodans, who he led east and then back to Europe and some of the Latin Jewish Rodans, or the Hebrew Rodans settled in northwestern Spain where as trained warriors they were welcome in the fight to preserve the freedom of northwestern Spain from the Muslims. More on more war. So these Hebrews were fighting against the Muslims. So when they try to Islam us today all day, that wasn't always the case that everyone's talking that language, man. Who Then who are the Hebrew Rodons <laughs> settling in northwestern Spain that are trained warriors fighting for the, for the freedom, my nigga? The freedom. Fighting to preserve the freedom from the Muslims. So Moab is trying to enslave Israel. <laughs> In Eber, Eber, Iberia, man. All right. Rodrigo, which comes from Roda. The name Rodrigo comes from the Roda. Rodrigo El Cid, C-I-D, was Tapuzin's great grandson. Tapuzin's son was called Lain Calvo, who is also Lancelin of Kalelus. And then the fairy tale King Arthur, who was really supposed to be King David of Camelot, we actually have Kalelus as reality. So Camelot is Kalelus. And that Lancelot character is Lancelin. You see the play play. So it's built in a foundational, you know what I'm saying? There's a foundational legend to this whole thing. Kalelus is Camelot. Lancelot is Lancelot. And who's his sister? Who's the sister of Lancelot or Lancelot of Kalelus? Rodrigo El Cid and his father, Diego La Lanes, who was also Jacob, married into the Davidic Exilarch family of Barcelona. Huh. His daughter, Maria Rodriguez, which is also Rhoda, right, was the, the wife of Raymond Beringer, the fourth Arnold Count of Barcelona, descended in the direct male line from Gubelin, G-U-I-B-E-L-N, who was Gui Alberic Belan Yakir Ben Judah of Narbon, the youngest son of Makir Tadros of Septimania. <laughs> so this Ben Judah is the youngest son of Amarik Nehemiah Theodorus. 
Now, Lancelot's sister, Lane Calvo's sister, Lancelot's sister is Shemina, spelled X-I-M-E-N-A, of Kalelus, who married Fernan Nunez of the Counts of Amaya, Amaya family. And some genealogists have confused the ancestors of this family of the El Cid. The British Jewish wrote unsettled in Wales in the 12th century. Their descendants in Wales went with Prince Madoc up of Juan to America, where they established themselves in a series of forts in Alabama and Georgia. The Alabama Welsh website states in regards to Prince Madoc, quote, in 1170 AD, 10 small ships assembled off Lundy Island in the Bristol Channel, which flows between South Wales and Southern England. He and his 10 ships were never heard from again. It was many years later when the archeological discovery of European style structures in the Southeast built centuries before Columbus's journey prompted a review of the Welsh histories of Madoc's voyage, a series of pre-Columbian stone fortifications built up the Alabama River were discovered by later settlers. The Basque and Portuguese descendants of the Lane or the Latin Hebrew Rodon settlers, the Basque and the Portuguese descendants of the Hebrew Rodons went to America after 1492. Another group of Hebrew Rodons never left America and they eventually moved to the Appalachian Mountains. Prester John of Appalachia come to baptize you and me. Remember that song, man? <laughs> so what's Prester John baptizing in, man? He's He got the fountain of youth, man. He got that water that turned you back to the age of 32. So these Hebrews go and move to the Appalachian and were later called the Melungeons. <laughs> and Prince Madoc was a descendant of King Jacob ben Israel Had Rodri, the Rhoda. King Jacob Iago of Gwynedd, 1033 to 1039, was the brother of Lancelin or Lane Calvo. So Jacob is the brother of Lancelin. His sister is Shemina. Or Lancelin of Kalelus of Spain. His father was King Israel the seventh of Kalelus. Is this play play? Or you want to throw this history out because they throw this history away? Or do you want to use it to take the breadcrumbs by Naga and rebuild our house? Because this is history no one else can use. That's why they choose to lose. They, they choose to lose this stuff. They don't teach you this. <laughs> you know, and even if this author has his, his own agenda, you know. Uh, you know, this. <laughs> hey, look, you know, we, we've been back and forth with this author for years, you know. Um, but I still give this author a high because... A lot of, I think the necessary recon has been done for us to put our story together. His father was King Israel the seventh of Kalelus, not King Edwal of Gwynedd, as supposed in some genealogy. Hey man, see if your uh, 23andMe genealogy test brings you back to Kalelus, man. <laughs> Or are you still going to be sub-Saharan African, man? <laughs> We're just surfing the wave. Hey, man. Allow Treasures of Utah. Hey, all praise a that we can uh, dig through. All this great recon with a dragonfly perspective and just look forward for more. Look out for us, man, and enjoy the flow. 
right here for to to the drop. All praise our framer and our shaper. And uh, shout out to the ether squad. Make sure you download the app and surf the wave with its live and full effect. Shalom to the tribe.